It's been a good week for me. I hope it's been a good week for you. One of the big things this week uh, in my life, personally, was it was my birthday this last Tuesday, and, and Tuesday was a great day because it was my birthday. Um, but then Wednesday rolled around, and it got even better. I mean, imagine that. It got any better. Came to Wednesday night. We had all of the, the kind of regular Wednesday night things. You know, we had all the kids with Blast and, and our teenagers with Forge, and we had the dinner and all of that. Well, during the dinner, everybody broke out in song and sang happy birthday to me. And that was a really good thing, and that's kind of what it looked like. That's how many candles were on the cake, okay? So uh, it's, it's one of those big birthdays. Uh, and in fact, one of our college students, uh, they, they brought a, a Dairy Queen ice cream birthday cake for Doug. Now, is that cool or what? I mean, that's really nice, you know? So, um, but it, it is one of those birthdays where there are so many candles on the cake that uh, it's, it's kind of a double invitation. Part of the invitation is uh, for you just to celebrate, you know? Wow, I made it this far. God's good. Thank you for life. You know, celebrate. Um, but the other thing that comes when you start getting that many candles on your cake is that a birthday is an invitation to uh, reflect also. And so I began to reflect on just the blessings of God in my life, you know, kind of through the years, through a lot of birthdays. And one of those uh, blessings uh, was, I mean, it's my marriage, um, my wife. I mean, what a wonderful blessing of God in my life. And then our daughters, they are also a blessing. And, and my ministry in North Platte, I mean, that also is a blessing of God. So I've been blessed. And I celebrated those things. But, but also, when, when you get to have a certain number of candles on your cake, you begin, you begin reflecting in another direction too. And part of that direction is, am I learning anything, you know, in life? I mean, have I learned anything or am I just kind of doing the, the, making the same mistakes over and over again? And as I reflected on that, what are the lessons of life that I'm learning uh, there was one that kind of stood out more than all the others. And, and it kind of goes like this. The lesson I've learned is, is that I need to stay focused on the things that Jesus is calling me to do and to be. I need to stay focused on the things that Jesus is calling me to be and to do. Now, to you, that's probably very easy, okay? For me, it's not so easy. I mean, it takes some effort on my part. And the reason is because in my life, at least, there are distractions. And there's something called busyness that creeps in. And, and there are expectations, my own and those of others, and maybe even God's expectations. And then in all of us, there's a certain amount of brokenness in there. And all of those different things, the distractions and expectations and busyness and brokenness, all of those make it difficult sometimes to remain focused on what Jesus wants us to be and calls us to do. And, and I think this is exactly the challenge that the apostles were facing uh, as we read about the church in the book of Acts, and especially in chapter 6, is, is that it was becoming increasingly more difficult for them to remain focused on what Jesus was calling them to be and to do. Now, part of this is just the things that you and I face every day. It's that busyness, and, and it's that expectations, and, and it's, it's all of those things, the distractions. But there was something else that made it more difficult for them, I think. And that had to do with the sheer size of the church over which they were uh, responsible for leading. You know, I, I shared last week that the church, um, you know, this is the first church in the whole history of Christendom. And it was born in their very first worship experience with 3,000 people. Well, you read just a little bit further, and what you see is that uh, in a matter of days, or maybe weeks at the most, another 5,000 people were added to that number. So suddenly we're up to 8,000 people who are gathering to worship Jesus Christ, and there's only one church in the whole world. So it's not like they can go to a smaller church someplace else. This is it. Now, 
one of the things that we forget because we tend to live in a little bit more uh, kind of liberated uh, culture than the first century, but in first century Palestine, the culture was very patriarchal. And let me tell you what that means. When the ushers counted the number of people in worship, they counted just the men because women in that culture and children had no value. Now, that's offensive to us, but that's a reality in the first century. Women and children had no value. So if there's 8,000 men in worship, one person has estimated that the total number, counting women and children, probably approached 20,000 people. Imagine a church with 20,000 people in worship. I bet there's some busyness involved in that, isn't there? Wouldn't there be some expectations that sometimes would be overwhelming? Wouldn't there be some distractions? Can you imagine that there's at least a few people in that crowd who have some brokenness in their lives that kind of plays out in some unhealthy ways? Sure there is. Well, what we learn in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, is that amongst all the other challenges that the apostles are facing leading, leading this church, there is also a major division amongst the people that is based on their culture, their customs, their language. Now, in the text, it refers to the, the, the Hellenistic Jews. Well, another way to talk about them is they're the Greek Jews, okay? And then it talks about the Hebrew Jews. The Hebrew Jews are kind of the localized uh, Jews. And I want to talk about these two groups just a little bit so that you kind of get a grasp for how deep the division is amongst these groups. And yet they all are a part of the body of Christ and they all love Jesus. So they're trying to overcome these things, but that doesn't mean that they get there all at once. So the Greek Jews, these Hellenistic Jews, what's their story? Well, their story is that they came to Jerusalem from all around the world, all around the Roman Empire. And their background is Greek. I mean, they, they speak a different language. They dress in different clothing. They have different customs. Their cultural background is different because of all that Greek uh, kind of influence on them. But they come to Jerusalem on a spiritual pilgrimage because in their heart, they are still devout Jews. And one of the greatest celebrations in the life of a devout Jew would be the Passover festival. And so they come to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Well, we heard about this a few weeks ago at, at, at Easter. And during the Passover festival, that's when Jesus, that's when Jesus celebrated the Last Supper in the upper room. What they were actually doing was celebrating the Passover meal as a part of this festival. And then you know Jesus was executed during the Passover festival. And he also was raised from death to life in the Passover festival. All of these Greek Jews who have come here on a spiritual pilgrimage to be a part of the Passover festival begin to believe in Jesus. They've seen his death. They've seen the resurrection. They even see the birth of the church and they decide to stay in the city. So the Greek Jews are immigrants who bring in Greek culture, Greek language, Greek customs, even the Greek clothing styles. And then you have the Hebrew Jews. They're natives to Jerusalem. They've never left. They've always been there. And, and you can imagine when you never go outside the city that, that you tend to buy into those customs and those cultures, those traditions even more. Sometimes we might call them a little more conservative or a little more orthodox. Nothing wrong with that. But they're speaking a different language. And their customs and their culture are different in that way. So you have these two different groups. And they're, they're coexisting within the life of the church pretty well until... The Greek Jews notice that the Greek widows are not getting their fair share of food each day. And they're kind of thinking that the reason the Greek widows are not getting their fair share of food is because they're Greek. 
And that feels a little bit like intolerance. It feels a little bit like prejudice. It, it feels a little bit like bias. And, and it's alarming to them. And, and, and it doesn't matter if you're a Greek Jew or a Hebrew Jew. It doesn't matter because the teaching from the beginning of time by the Lord God is you take care of the widows and the orphans, and so they both have the same value. But the Greek Jews raise a question, say, what's going on here? This isn't right. And they bring this to the apostles. So the apostles have to deal with this divisiveness. The, the division is over social and cultural differences among the people in the church. You know, it, it's kind of a reminder to me that, and I, I, I don't think I've ever heard it here at First Church, but I have heard it in other churches, and, and, and sometimes it's kind of played out in this way. We don't want those kind of people in our church, or we don't want those kind of people in our club, or we don't want those kind of people to play cards with us, or we don't want those kind of people in our company. And that's exactly what the apostles are facing here. It's just different culture, different customs, different life experiences. And so they have to deal with this. They have to deal with it. And they begin to. And one of the things that the apostles realize straight up is that they are not the whole problem, but they are a part of the problem. And I'm here to tell you, when there is a problem in your family or in your workplace or at your school, and if you're a part of that, one of the first steps is simply admitting that you're part of the problem along with everybody else. That's a big, big thing. And they do. They, they admit that, and they admit that to the church. They have become overwhelmed and distracted from the things that Jesus has called them to do. And that is causing a part of the problem in this church. So what the apostles do is this. They step back and they also step down from what they've been doing. And what the apostles are doing is they're trying to do everything. And I will tell you, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in a church and it doesn't work in a business, and it doesn't work at school. It doesn't work when everyone is trying to do everything. And so they step back, and they step down. And the way I would say it is sometimes we have to get low in order for Jesus to use us and to use other people. And so what happens is the apostles ask the people of the church to select seven people to coordinate the feeding of the hungry. That's a pretty incredible thing. In Acts chapter 6, verse 3, they give the instructions. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task. Now, what I hear in this is they're looking for people with four characteristics, four characteristics. And one of those would be that they, have, they are in good standing in the church and in the community. In other words, they're people with strong morals and they have deep Christ-like character. The second thing is that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, they are people of faith. They're people of faith. And the third thing is that they be filled with godly wisdom. Godly wisdom. Because this is going to be a complex matter. They're going to need more smarts than they have on their own. They're going to need a godly wisdom. And so they need that. And the fourth thing is that they're available to serve. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with nominations committee and we find someone and, and they are in good standing. They have good character. And their faith in Christ is very deep. And they have, they have this godly wisdom. But they're not available. Because their job takes them out of town too often. Or they have an aging parent whose health is deteriorating very rapidly. And they need to spend time there. Or maybe they have a child with special needs. And so it requires an incredible amount of energy and time. Or maybe they have a health issue of their own. So they meet the first three, but they're just not available to serve 
in this season? Well, the church chooses leaders who are honest and reliable and well-liked. They choose leaders who are spiritually mature and the Holy Spirit is working in their lives and they also possess wisdom. Now, what's interesting is that Luke lists the names of these seven people. And it's hard for us to tell because we're not Greek scholars and all, but if you study it a little bit, but what you learn is this, that there's not a single Hebrew Jewish name in the list. Six out of the seven are Greek Jews. Interesting, isn't it? Six out of the seven are Greek Jews. And the seventh is not a Greek Jew or a Hebrew Jew. He's a Gentile. He's not Jew, not Jew, not Jewish, okay, at all. So it's just interesting that the, the people choose seven people who are most highly invested in the care of feeding the hungry in their midst. And that always is a place where God's blessing can be great, is if we choose the people who are most passionate, most deeply invested in serving, they will not give up and they will not give in. And that's exactly what we see. And then you add on to this. Who are these people? Well, they're the Greek Jews. They're the immigrants. They're the immigrants who have come into this church. They are by far the minority group. But here's the thing. Because the apostles step back and step down, because they get low, it gives them the opportunity to do exactly what Jesus is calling them to do, but it opens the door for other people to live out their call in ministry as well. So in uh, chapter 6, verse 6, the, the church had these men stand before the apostles and they prayed and they laid hands on them. Laid hand, laying on of hands is like the transmission of authority from the apostles into these people. It's another indication that they step down and they step back from that. And as they get low, Jesus is able to do amazing things. Look at verse 7 where it says, the word of God continue to spread. Think about this now, that the apostles take a very broad menu of tasks and responsibilities and they narrow it down to two, prayer and preaching the word. That's all they're going to do, prayer and preaching the word. They're going to pray and they're going to preach a word. And what happens when they do that? When they get low, they're able, they are used by Christ. The word of God continued to spread. There's something else that happened. The text says the number of disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem. Even though the apostles step back and step down, they get low. It allows other people to be used by Christ. And the third thing is really amazing. A great many of the priests, let's just call those the pastors, a great many of the pastors became obedient to the faith, which means this was so amazing what the apostles did, how they got low to be used by Jesus, that even some of the clergy came to believe in Jesus, okay? Think about that a little bit. Even the clergy began to believe in the power of Jesus to change lives and to do amazing things. The church grows, and we grow. And the kingdom grows when we focus on the one or two things that Jesus has called us to be or to do. So before we go to prayer, I want to just ask a couple of questions to focus us. What is the one thing or the two things to which Jesus is calling you? What's the one or two things to which Jesus is calling you in your life? If you can't do it all, What's the one or two things? What is he calling you to do? And then let me ask a second question too. Is the busyness in your life, is the busyness in your life distracting you from being truly used by Jesus? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Well, Jesus, oh, thank you for being so patient with us. 
Our lives are incredibly busy, and it is so easy for us to become distracted. Our lives are filled with so many expectations, and, and we even feel them from the church and from you, Jesus, and, and, and sometimes all the expectations just overwhelm us. And sometimes, Lord, it's, it's that broken place inside of it, that place inside of us that just hurts. And it keeps us from focusing on what you want us to be and what you want us to do in our lives. So, Lord God, thank you for being patient with us. And we pray that today you would continue to grow our hearts for you, but also, Lord, that, that you would create in us this kind of humble spirit. This kind of humble spirit where we could step back one step, step down one level, and really let you use us in one or two arenas. So Lord, thank you for being patient. But continue to speak into our hearts, our minds, and our souls what you would have us to be and what you would have us to do. And let us find, dear Jesus, the courage, the courage to do that one thing. May your kingdom continue to grow. May people continue to increase in their faith and come to love you. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.